Um, I want to now just go into one of the uh, structures that is used for storing um, binary for storing uh, Boolean logic for storing truth tables inside the a computer or in general and it's called the binary decision diagram or BDD and it's very widely used throughout synthesis and throughout different algorithms that do all kinds of things on uh, on net lists okay so BDDs are directed acyclic graphs that represent the truth table of a given function so we take a truth table here just uh, some sort of a truth table with three uh, inputs x1 x2 and x3 and one output which is called f and we see the um, uh, we see the, uh, uh, the the truth table over here what each uh, input state will provide we can show a, a binary decision diagram which takes each one of these uh, inputs in order and so x1 is our first input we put it at the first level and what we get basically is these um, like layers so so this here is the layer of x1, this is the layer of x2, this is the layer of x3, and this is the layer of the outputs, okay, which is f. Um, so it's very important to, to already notice that the ordering here is very important. So if we would write this function x2, x3, x1, or x3, x2, x1, or some other way, we would get a different BDD. Okay, so the ordering is important. So here we have x1, x2, x3, and what we do is we look at the root node, x1 and we say if x1 is 0 we go with this uh, dotted line over here um, uh, over here and we write a 0 on it if x1 is 1 we go to uh, on, a, on a solid line over here and we get two nodes of x2 okay um, again let's say we have uh, x2 and we have uh, a 0 we go on the dotted line over here or 1 over here and we keep on traversing down this diagram until we get to the output level and see what the uh, value of the function is let's take an example of um, okay this line 0 1 0 equals 1 so again x1 equals 0 so we go down over to here x2 equals 1 so we go down over here and x3 equals 0 we go down over here and we see that the value of f is 1. Okay, another example, we'll take the last line, 1, 1, 0, and we should get an output of 1. So we start at the beginning, 1, 1, and 0, and the output is 1 as expected. So it's very easy to map one of these um, types of truth tables exactly to a binary decision diagram. Another important thing to notice about a binary decision diagram is that each um, one of these nodes actually has a tree under it. So if we were to now uh, get rid of x1 over here and only look at x2 as the root of our tree, we can see that if x2 equals 0 and x3 equals 0, we get a 1. So we have 0, 0, that's x1, x2, okay, and f, we get 1, right? And then we can go um, 0, uh, if x2 equals 0 and x3 equals 1, we get 1. So 0, 1, 1. And then if we go x2 equals 1 and x3 equals 0, we get 1. So uh, again, x2, did I make the mistake here? Um, sorry, that was x2 and x3, right? Okay, so if x2 equals 1 and x3 equals 0, we get a 1. And again, we go um, again, uh, 1, 1, and we get a 0. So 1, 1, 0. And so we can see that the... Um, that the calculate that what we get here is basically a NAND gate and you can so that means that this node if we start just looking at this node as the tree we get x2 x3 and not so each one of these nodes basically is uh, in the binary decision diagram um, represents a complete boolean function and we can actually describe many many boolean functions with just one bdd okay um just you can also look here as a small example. If we look at this node, we see that if x3 equals 0, we get a 1. And if x3 equals 1, we get a 0. So that is exactly x3 bar. We can make many different things. Um, if we wanted to show the actual BDD of the function 1, the constant 1, we would just put a pointer over, uh, sorry, that's 0, a pointer over to one of these leaves of 1. Okay, that's a binary decision diagram. Um, another uh, property that I just want to point out of the binary decision diagram relates to the Shannon expansion theorem. So the Shannon expansion of a function relates to the, uh, relates the function to its cofactors. Cofactors are also very important uh, binary computational Boolean algebra 
um, things that you can do, things like uh, uh, derive uh, put and find the derivative of a Boolean function with them. So if we have a Boolean function f of x1, x2, etc., in the middle somewhere we have xi, as you can see here, okay? Um, the positive cofactor, which would be called xi of 1, would be the function of all those same x's, but instead of xi, we would stick a 1. Um, similarly, the negative cofactor, cofactor, if we have xi of 0, we would put a 0 here and find out what the function is. So those are the cofactors, and what the Shannon's uh, expansion theorem states is that f is xi bar times the a negative cofactor of i plus xi times the positive cofactor of i, or uh, we can have a, a similar uh, function down here. That's Shannon's expansion theorem. And why am I talking about this now? Because uh, a BDD is exactly a representation of Shannon's, uh, uh, of Shannon's expansion theorem. So look, we have f, f is pointing at our first variable at a, and what do we have over here? If a equals zero, then we get this function. If a equals 1, then we get this function. Well, look, if a equals 0, then we get, this must be the uh, negative cofactor. Negative cofactor. And accordingly, this is the positive cofactor. So it's a very nice representation that can also give us the cofactors quickly of, um, of, a, a, of a Boolean function. And that is very useful for different things that we do in um, computational Boolean algebra. Um, so there is a problem with BDDs. BDDs get very big. Let's see if we can provide a reduced representation. And amazingly, um, if we look at the BDDs, and again, on our last line, we have 2 to the power of n uh, if we have n um, variables. So that's very big. That's really a, a big, uh, a lot of data, a big representation, and we want to reduce this. We can take three very simple, I would call them, they seem almost trivial rules, and we can see we can get to something called a reduced order BDD. We can throw away a lot of those nodes in, in, the, in the representation. Okay, so our first rule for reduction is we're going to merge equivalent leaves. So if we saw in our picture before that we have these leaves, which are these squares, and remember they have either a zero or a one inside, we're going to take all of the zeros and make them into a single square and all of the ones and take them into a single square. And the arcs that pointed to our zeros, we're going to move all of them to point into the single, um, uh, the single um, zero that we'll have left. So if we look over here, we have this guy, this x3 is pointing to zero and this x3 is pointing to zero with a dotted line, and this x3 is pointing to zero with a solid line. So we're going to take this guy and this guy and this guy and turn them into one uh, one um, square here, and then we're going to move this and this and this arc to point at them. Okay. Um, I, uh, similarly, we have this, 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 and this, and we see that this is pointing to it, this is pointing to it, this is pointing to it, and this is pointing to it. We're missing a zero over here, I guess. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to turn all of those into a one and have everybody pointing at them. So that was kind of a very trivial, strange step, but it already uh, reduced at least this line. So instead of having uh, two to the power of n of these leaves, we only have two leaves here. We still have uh, the same number of these arcs. So it probably didn't reduce much, but it will help us in a moment. So our reduction, our second reduction rule a bit more complex than the first one, but still pretty trivial. We're going to do what we call to merge isomorphic nodes. So if we have two of these uh, variables that are at a similar level, so this is called x, could have been called x2 before or whatever, and we see that when this x equals 0, we go to y, and when x equals 1, we go to z. And this x also, when x equals 0, we go to y, and x equals 1, we go to z. We see that this and this representation of x they exactly behave the same. So why do we need both of them? We will merge them. So we'll erase one of them, take the arc that was going into that one and push it into that one. And we don't have to do any, and we just 
delete these arcs because they don't exist anymore and uh, because what was happening from there is exactly the same as what was happening before so that's called merging isomorphic nodes because those nodes are isomorphic so let's look at our uh, diagram here and we can see for example if we take this x3 and this x3 we look and x3 is equals 0 it goes to 1 and x3 equals 1 goes to 0 and again x3 equals 0 goes to 1 and x3 equals 1 goes to 0 hmm that means that these guys are isomorphic. We can merge them. So that means we're going to take these two guys and point there, erase that, erase that, and uh, then we can erase this and this, and we're done. So what we get here is this one x3. Both of these x2s, you see there are one arcs go to this x3, and the output of x3 is, of course, what it was here before. x3 equals, uh, equals 0, we go to 1. x3 equals 1, we go to 0. And now we have less nodes. Instead of having four nodes on this level, we only have three. So we were able to reduce the size of our BDD. Okay, so our last reduction rule is we're going to eliminate redundant tests. This is another trivial looking thing, but again, it results in uh, a, a large re uh, reduction of the size of the BDD, which make it a useful tool. So now we had this X that gets these two arcs that come into it and two arcs that go out to it, and the two arcs go to exactly the same node. Well then, why do we even need this x? We can skip it altogether, and we'll just erase it, and we'll erase the arcs between it, and move these guys to point down to here, and that's what we see here on, on the side. So let's look, for example, at what we have here, and you can see that this x3, both, it doesn't matter if it's 0 or 1, both of them are going to point to 1. So what can we do? We can get rid of it. We can take this arc, Remove this, remove this, remove this, and just point this arc down to 1. Okay, and that's what we see here. We just point it straight down to 1, and we skip this node altogether. We were able to skip this one in a similar way. And you see that we were able to reduce our BDD to only have four of these internal nodes and two output nodes instead of the big tree that we had before. And that's on a small uh, BDD, but if we would take... Uh, something with a lot of variables, our reduction can be, at certain points, uh, very, very efficient. Okay. So, why are reduced order BDDs so, um, uh, so important? Well, there are a few different things here. Um, BDDs, it turns out, are canonical, or at least reduced order BDDs, excuse me, are canonical. In other words, what that means is that if we take a certain ordering in x1, x2, x3 versus an x3, x2, x1, if we take a certain ordering, it doesn't matter what our start point is. If we uh, iteratively ap ap apply our three reduction rules until we have no more reduction that's uh, possible to do, we are going to arrive at exactly the same ROBDD for every, um, for every uh, um, starting representation of our, uh, of our function no matter how many of these things we have. And that gives us a lot of uh, cool things. Um, however, it's important to pay attention that the ordering, again, is, uh, is important. If we would change the ordering, we may get a better reduction or a worse reduction. And it's very hard to find, there are many heuristics to do it, but it's very hard to find the best ordering for a BDD, for a reduced order BDD, to get it to have the smallest representation in our memory uh, of our computer. Um, so some benefits that we can do, it's very easy to check for tautology, okay? Tautology means that a um, function is a constant one. Hmm. Well, we said before that the, uh, the BDD of a function one is just this. This is the BDD of a function one. Now, I said that a reduced order BDD is canonical. So once we apply our reduction rules, we're going to end up with this, despite the fact that we may have had a million um, variables at the input. And that's really cool. It's really easy to check for um, for uh, tautology because all we have to do is apply our reduction rules on our reduced order BDD, and we will arrive at uh, this type of representation. And then we know that the function is a constant one. Okay, and so it's very easy to do things like complementation of a function and um, equivalence checking. So, for example, what we could do is we could take uh, two functions f1 and f2. Okay, and we can just stick them into an XOR gate. And if F1 and F2 are equivalent, that means that what we will get at the output is a zero. And if they are not equivalent, we will get a, a, a one. Um, if it's a zero, right, that means that what we're going to have is after we apply our reduced order BDD, we're just going to have 
something like that. So it's really easy to do this logic equivalence check. And this is one of the things that are used in logic equivalence uh, checkers from commercial tools for formal verification. Um, so just the final point is that I already mentioned before that the size of a BDD can vary drastically if the, uh, if the order in which the variables are expanded is changed. And the number of nodes in the BDD can be exponential in number of variables in the worst case, even after reduction. So sometimes it is too big to use actually. Okay, but anyway, a BDD is something that you will probably run into in the future, and it's very worthwhile to understand the mechanics of it and know how it works.